everything God created is alive. I'm sure that's not news to anybody, but I want to talk about it today. Everything God created is alive. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And in the beginning also was the Word. And the Word was God and the Word was with God. And there was God in Genesis, in the creation, creating the very foundation of our our being here on earth, our reason and our ability to be on earth. God created the foundation for man to be able to even live on this planet, providing all things that we need for life and for godliness. And there we were newly formed, newly breathed into living souls, almost like the planet was our nursery I mean, don't you create a nursery for your new baby when you bring your baby home? God gave us everything we needed right here in the earth, like a giant nursery. And I don't mean that as a pun, even though there was a garden and trees that are growing up are considered part of a nursery. But God created all of that for mankind, but he never expects us to stay as babies. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And God said, let there be light. God just spoke. And in the second day, God created order out of what was to to be at the top, what was to be at the bottom. He set the proper orientation of things. And then God, on the third day, He added more things. He said, well, what are they going to eat? So he provided us vegetation and food to eat. God is giving us everything we need to live. And on the fourth day, God did more creating. And on the fifth day, and God built everything. He gave us the waters and the earth and the sky. And God put living things in all of it. Because everything God creates is alive not just us, but everything. And I say all this to say that even people who say they want to live off the grid, they really mean the grid created by humans, the human grid, I'll call it. Because there's nothing that God made in creation that we don't need to exist because we need it to exist. And it's because of God, and it's because of God, God alone, that we can exist, that we can live. We owe our existence and our lives to our Heavenly Father. Amen. So everything that has breath should praise the Lord. And everything has breath in its own way. Because everything God created is alive. The heavens declares glory. The earth declares his majesty. We are created to worship God. Let everything that has breath praise him. God continued to create on the sixth day and on the seventh day. He rested. But on that sixth day, he said to all the animals and everything that he had created, Be fruitful and multiply. And he said to man, be be sure to subdue the earth. Fill the earth and subdue it. And this is what we're supposed to do. We have rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, every creature that crawls upon the earth because it is all alive. So getting a command from God to be fruitful and multiply presupposes that One is alive and that one should remain alive. But man, because man is either clueless or curious or easily deceived by the serpent, he just kept choosing death instead of life, doing the opposite of what God said do, doing the opposite of what God had prepared the earth to do for us and with us and in conjunction that is to live so by Deuteronomy God is having to tell man look 
You know, do you want to be alive or not? Choose life. But then the devil presents another strategy, another tactic, another while, because he's subtle, they say, in, in Genesis. And what does the devil do? I don't know, dip a poison mushroom into chocolate and he hands it to a man. And what does man do? He makes the wrong choice again. And then the devil presents the fun of the nightlife, the fun of a flesh life, of a sin life. And man does what? He forgets that most nightlife and all sin leads to death because sin and death travel together. It's a word problem. Man, all we had to do was listen. What is the devil saying? This is a word problem. We could figure this out by help of God, by help of prayer, by help of friends and loved ones, and by the Holy Spirit. We can figure out what to do. So the devil begins to disguise and retouch and recolor and repackage and represent sin because man has forgotten what he did last time. And so man forgets that this is sin or either he's thinking about how much fun this was. And so man wants to walk toward death. So he does. But everything God created is alive and it has a life in it. And it leads to more life. It leads to multiplication and fruitfulness. God says, choose life. And he gives us everything we need for life. So if we just stay on the grid that God created, you know, the one from creation, then God will give us even more good things, even nicer things to enjoy. And so we can have that life and have the more abundant life that Jesus came to provide for us. Thank you, Lord. But then the devil makes up his own grid and then he overlays that fake grid over God's grid and then he presents it either so often to man or he presents it so well or both that man forgets that it's a hologram it's a fake it's a counterfeit grid that leads to death I mean come on the devil can't be that good so that even as death is pursuing man please tell me man is not also pursuing death Everything God made is alive and God gives us a place. He gives us protection, provision, peace so we can stay alive. And God didn't make anything dead. And even if he rolls up on something that's dead, God quickens it to make it alive. And therefore it lives and it lives and it breathes and it lives again. And God doesn't make anything dead. And that's why he is repulsed by dead things, fake things, idol gods. And Jesus cursed the fig tree that had no figs. It had leaves, but no figs, so it was a fake. But everything that God makes and everything God has made is alive and it is productive. So we as humans, we should also be able to tell dead from alive and real from fake, fresh from frozen if necessary. And because we often, we pride ourselves in our palates, for instance, how discerning we are, that we're connoisseurs and we have these fantastic taste buds. I mean, it's kind of like knowing the difference in going to a fine dining restaurant that creates delicious fresh dishes versus one that just microwaves stuff from the freezer section of the grocery store. If your taste buds can discern the difference, shouldn't a man be able to tell the difference between living and dead? And shouldn't that man then be able to not gravitate to that which is dead, that which is dying, or that which will lead to death? Choose life. Choose ye this day whom ye will serve. That's out of Deuteronomy and out of Joshua 24, 14. Now, therefore, fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. 
And that means put away those gods that we used to serve when we were in sin, since Egypt is the symbol for sin. Deuteronomy 30, 15 through 20. I'm going to read the whole thing. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. And that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but shalt be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish, that is die, and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land whither thou passest over Jordan to go to possess it. I call heaven and earth to record, record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. Amen. King James Version, Deuteronomy 30, 15 through 20. So God wants us to choose to be alive. Choose life. Choose living versus dying versus death. Choose to live. But man keeps doing things. Man is looking past the fake, looking past what's phony, even when it's in a bad disguise. He looks past the overlay of the false grid and he pretends he's not choosing death, but he's pretending. He pretends he is not choosing death when he's actually choosing death. And really, he's choosing sin, but he's, it's been disguised and presented to him as entertainment, amusement, fun, daring adventures rebellion, flesh pleasures, greed, other works of the flesh. And he's ignoring that death is attached to it. And when that man doesn't die immediately, he thinks he beat death. Revelations 12, 9, King James Version. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. The devil has made traps and pits and dishes, ditches and derailments. All these things that he's hoping will lead man to death while God is still imploring us, telling us, teaching us to live, live, live and so the devil perverts the definition of live and humans unfortunately many fall for it and it is so perverted that those people who think they are living you know living their own life are actually on the broad road that leads to death and death pursues a man and man pursues death Death pursues a man because of sin, because they travel together, sin and death. And man pursues death because of sin, as he pursues sin, because sin and death travel together. And the devil entices man to sin, and sin leads to death. And the devil keeps finding ways to put the consequence, you know, death, into fine print and finer print and finer print, smaller print, because really there's nothing fine about the devil and there's nothing fine about death. Man wants free will and he has free will, but he keeps choosing death. We need to be wise. We can't let the devil keep tricking us. So we serve the only living God. God is alive. Jesus is alive. And we commemorate that especially today. Thank you, Lord. Jesus is alive. Everything God made is alive. He made Jesus as his only begotten son, the firstborn of many brethren. And even though he was dead, he is alive. And he yet lives and will live forever. Amen. 
So here we are on the planet with our free will. I mean, God really could child-proof the planet. I mean, sin-proof the planet. But man has his free will. But if we take that time to think, and one way we can avoid the mistakes, these mishaps, and avoid sin is to look very closely and then ask ourselves, ask God, ask the Holy Spirit, but start with yourself if you want, and ask, is there life in this? Is there life in this activity, in this action, in this choice? Does this choice lead to life and more life? Does it lead to multiplication or does it lead to death? Does it lead to sin and death? Your answers are all clues. And here we are, we're supposed to be living and moving and breathing, having our being. Instead of dealing with that person or that entity who likes to still kill and destroy, we need to be over here on this side dealing with God. God gives instead of steals from us. He doesn't steal, he gives. God makes alive instead of killing. And God preserves us instead of destroying. And this is why on the cross, Jesus was on that cross to redeem mankind back to the Father. And Jesus opened not his mouth because you see everything Jesus said and everything he did had impact. We should be the same way. But Jesus didn't fool around and mess around with words because Jesus is the word. And when he spoke, things happened and we should be the same way when you speak things should happen good things right things right away or maybe later or eventually depending on your faith and depending on the faith of the person or the thing you're speaking to but things should happen and things actually do happen but I mean good things should happen so Jesus opened not his mouth at the wrong time because when we're going through for instance Jesus was going through a torture he was going through the shame of the cross. Well, this was leading up to it. And the, the ridicule, the humiliation, the sorrow, the grief that Jesus took for you and me, for our redemption, from the sin and the death that we chose or that we were tricked out of or tricked into or that we thought we were so clever we could just roll up on it and defeat death. That's what Jesus came to do. But when you open your mouth while you're going through, I mean, if you're undisciplined and unsaved, ungodly, carnal, got a fleshy old big mouth, you're probably going to say something you shouldn't say. And it may lead to further entrapment into sin, leading more, all the more to death. But Jesus had the discipline and the control. But Jesus, by opening not his mouth as he went through, Leading up to the cross, Jesus was showing us how to go through persecutions, how to go through pain and suffering, how to go through intercessions and substitutions and stand in the gap for others. Sometimes you speak only when necessary. And when you do speak, you speak the word. You speak the word of God and this way you don't set off any devil traps. Remember, he's wily. You don't set off any traps that are established in the spirit against us. Amen. So we make choices all day long, all night long. We can't be choosing death. We must choose life. But those choices are there with our free will, whether we are going to choose death or choose life. And we are binding and we are loosing all day and actually all night long with our words and yes, our actions, even our choices in our sleep and in our dream life. And that's why we must build up our spirit man so we can be victorious all the time, 24 seven. And in this earth, thank you, Lord, we have authority. We are created also as Christ was also created a little lower than Elohim. And we can't think that we can turn spiritual authority on and off. I mean, what a person in authority, a person with authority says and does has far more weight than what a person with no authority says or does. For instance, if you're the, the parent, the man of your house, for instance, or the head of your household, what you say has far more authority than what your five-year-old says 
to his friends or your neighbors or anybody. Oh, yeah, sure, you can come over. No, mom or daddy's got to give that permission, okay, because of the authority. So you can't turn it on and off. You're a person set in authority. You're in Christ. Don't play is what I'm really saying. You can't just say, oh, I was just kidding or psych, you know, never mind. No, sometimes you can't get out of some stuff that you've gotten in once you put your mouth in it or your foot in it. I mean, remember, there are monitoring spirits, familiar spirits waiting to report stuff you say and do, stuff you look at, stuff you choose. And these things are set up to entrap you into some sin or some evil or some evil contract and covenants. And that way you're choosing death. The devil is waiting for anybody to slip up, trying to entice you and entrap you to slipping up. So in Genesis, there's the account of God and God in creation. And by chapter three, man, you know, with all of his choices and his free will, he had already sinned and was already kicked out of the garden. Sin and death had already entered the realm. But the only way for man to come back to the Father was by Jesus Christ. A perfect and innocent man had to die in substitution for a sin-sick world. Lord, have mercy and thank you, Jesus. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man Hebrews 2 9 but Jesus in the revelation chapter 1 17 B says fear not I am the first and the last verse 18 he said I am he that liveth and was dead and behold I am alive forevermore amen and I have the keys of hell and of death. But before that, in the Garden of Gethsemane, before Jesus went to the cross, Jesus had asked the Father if it was possible to let that cup pass from him. Yeah, for all the reasons we've been told and taught through the years, all the things we've heard. But listen to this. Taking the cup was the same as Jesus choosing death. And you see, it is nowhere in God's nature, nowhere in Jesus' nature to choose death. Because Jesus was created and made and birthed and nurtured and wired to choose life. Do you see how hard this was? Do you see how hard this was? He's wired to choose life. Never death. So with time in the word and time in the presence of God, time in prayer and worship, we should all be rewired that same way to change the way our wiring is. We come here in sin, born in sin and iniquity. But God is telling us to choose life, make the right choices. And in our salvation, in our redemption, in our sanctification and justification back to the Father. Time in the word and time with the Father in the presence and in prayer and praise and worship. We are rewired to choose life. And Jesus' temptations in the wilderness, when he was tempted of the devil, the devil said, turn the stone into bread. That would have been death to Jesus because Jesus' time hadn't come yet. What authority or power would he be using to do that? And you don't use godly gifts for magic shows anyway. And the devil said, bow down and worship me. You see, for Jesus, that would have been death. Because we're to serve only God, not any idol or false God, not the devil ever. And the devil tempted Jesus further by saying, you know, jump down from here. 
jump from this pinnacle. You know, you can call angels to rescue you. That also would have been death. Nowhere in God, nowhere in Jesus is there any wiring or any way that he is wired to choose death. What is wrong with us? So shouldn't we automatically see through the devil's smoke screens and his tricks and also choose life even now? Especially when, since God has told us repeatedly over and over to choose life. You see, Jesus, during his ministry time, he chose life. He always chose life. He was full of life and he ministered to people and he blessed people. He healed them. He spoke to them and into their life and life flowed from him into the people because that's what was in Jesus the life of God. Just that Zoe, the life was all that was in him. There was no death in him. And he said in the New Testament, he said that the devil had nothing in him. The devil's full of death. John 1, in John 1, 4, in Jesus, in him was life. And the life was the light of men and the light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. So this is why when the woman with the issue of blood, that woman with the issue of blood, she had had it for 12 years. That was an issue of death. For 12 years, her life was ebbing out of her. It was an issue of death. And this is why Jesus felt her touch. Yes, because she was pulling virtue out of him. But Jesus felt that touch too because it was not a touch of life. It was foreign to him. And that touch drew on the life that was in him. And yeah, Jesus, Jesus's garments, that's what was touched. I mean, she touched the hem of his garment, but his garments were full of life too, because they touched him and everything he touched was full of life. I mean, weren't Paul's handkerchiefs full of life? Didn't his shadow heal? How about your handkerchiefs? How about the hem of your garments? How about you how about your shadow but I want you to get this now if Jesus could feel that one little woman's touch oh my god no wonder he was sweating like blood in the garden of Gethsemane how much more he would feel the sting of tasting death for every man every man Every man. Yet are we so callous as to pile on more sin knowingly, casually for Jesus to bear? And death pursues man. And yes, Jesus has authority over it. And we are here set in dominion with authority as well. And we should be endeavoring to be part of the solution to sin and death, not adding to the problem. And after Jesus was born, you know, there were at least eight times that I counted in the New Testament where people tried to kill him. Death was pursuing Jesus. Death pursued and pursues every man. But we should be so full of life and resurrection power and the healing graces and the truth and the word and so prayed up and full of praise and worship that when death tries to touch us, we heal it like the woman with the issue of blood. Because everything God made is alive and it should be full of life ready to be fruitful and to multiply, 
ready to be shared with one another ministry and reaching out to the lost, doing the work of an evangelist and bringing the lost back into the fold, redeeming them back to the Father. Amen. And on that, and Jesus opened out his mouth on that way to the cross and all of that torture that he was and shame that he endured. Sometimes it is best that we don't say anything. And Jesus not saying anything was really an indication of his full submission to that mission. The mission that was completely against everything that's in him. Life, giving life, healing life, helping life, speaking life. But by taking that cup in the Garden of Gethsemane, he chose death. And he chose it for me and you. And here we are, we should just, we do these little natural things in the, in the earth. And just because it's natural doesn't make it okay. I mean, here are some contracts, some evil deals and initiations that you may have made and you may not have even known you entered into them. Every song you've ever sung, especially with repetition, favorite secular, unbelieving, doubting songs that you've loved for years, 10 years, 20 years. What are the words to that song? And do those words, do those songs play with death in their words? If you really listen to them, are they skirting death? Is this a game? It is not. And you've made dance covenants too. Every song that you've ever danced to, especially with repetition over the years. What are the words to the music that you love? Those songs that you dance to. And do those songs play with death? And skirt death. Life is really not a game. And sometimes there are no words to the music you enjoy. But what is the significance of the music itself? And have any of these songs been enchanted? You don't know unless you pray and ask God. Are you soul tied to any certain songs with death words? Negative, doubting, unbelieving words. Are you soul tied to certain foods? This is another whole message, but I want to throw that in. So as I said, God can't really send proof humans by the Holy Spirit, but we want to exercise our free will. But we're to choose this day and we're supposed to choose life. And God is never trying to trick you. The devil is the one playing the shell game. He wants you to choose death. God formed you. God breathed life into you. God has redeemed you from the curse of the law so you can live, so we all can live. Thank you, Lord. And when we are sin sick, when we were sin sick in our polluted blood, God picked us up and he cleansed us and he redeemed us back to the kingdom by the blood of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Lord. And when we were dead in sin, God quickened us so that we could live again because God wants us to live. And God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son. How many Christians would do that for mankind, even if we could? So the very least we can do is to lay down our own flesh lives for the collective good of our own families, our own bloodlines. For mankind, we're feeling that gracious. You see, by not choosing life, death is the automatic choice in this realm that we live in. So you need to accept salvation today if you're not saved. Rededicate if you've been slack. And know that that's still not all there is. I mean, the ultimate goal is to live and to live in Christ eternally. And we begin with the end in mind, just as God did. We accept salvation because we want heaven. Amen. But in the middle, we must work out our salvation and walk it out, work it out with fear and trembling. We need to be wise, be mindful, be discerning. And don't let the false overlays of the world and of the devil deceive us. But you're saying maybe I didn't choose death. 
Maybe you did not. Maybe your ancestors did, and it's in your bloodline. You see, death can be programmed into a bloodline. And even if you're not aware of it, or if you haven't done anything about it, or looked into it at all, prayed about it, if you don't say anything about it and pray against it, it stands. Don't let that be your life. Don't let it pass on to your generations like that. Do something. This is the time to open your mouth. Not when you're on the way to the cross. Open your mouth now on this side. So we know from scriptures that Abraham tithed in Levi. That would be great if our ancestors tithed in us three and four generations ahead. Wouldn't that be wonderful? But maybe some of our ancestors sinned in us. My God, we weren't even born yet. But because of our current position, if we're saved in Christ and we're spirit filled. And because of our current prayer life and what comes out of our mouth, the words that we speak, they are spirit and they are life. And the spirit can go places even in time that human flesh can't go. Spirit is not bound by time. So we can speak down our ancestors line and we can repent for them. Thank you, Lord. And we can speak into the future, prophesying over our generations, our future generations. Thank you, Lord. The words we speak, they are spirit and they are life. And our walk in Christ, as long as we're in Christ, we can do a lot of good in our own prayer life. Amen. But Jesus hung on that cross to redeem all mankind back to the Father. And yet, I keep mentioning that we have our free will. So we must accept salvation and redemption and sanctification and justification through Christ Jesus. Submit to the Holy Ghost. Amen. Jesus, in the book of the Revelation, he makes himself known to John the Divine in a vision. And he says, I am the first and the last the firstborn. He is the Alpha and the Omega. And if the Lord goes before us and we are in Christ and he is our rear guard, nothing can separate us from him. Not death. As long as we keep choosing life and walking the way God says for us to walk. So in Christ, you, me, we're here on earth to be a solution to pre-existing problems, not to create more problems. We're here to help our bloodline, help the people in our people group, in our neighborhood, in the world. Not to be part of a problem or keep the same problems going or make it worse. We're here to help bring the solution to the problems of sin and death. And the devil, he wants us incorporated with him. He wants to use mankind, I don't know, as a human shield. I mean, is that why he wants us, wants mankind in hell? But shields, you see, don't fight. They just, they're, they're just there. They just lay there. We fight. We fight against the evil and the devil. We fight against sin. We fight to do what's right. We fight to help one another. We fight to live to stay alive and to help others live and stay alive. Amen. So we don't just stand there sinning. We repent and we just don't stand there. We stand in the gap for others. We just don't stand there and let the devil use us. We are part of the solution. We are part of the solution to the problem that is sin and death. Jesus has done his part. Now we do ours. And Jesus, because there's no other way by which man can be saved. Jesus has done his work. It is finished. So we shouldn't have to be choosing, making wrong choices. We shouldn't be captive. And if we are, we should know how to get out of being captive. Repent. Once we become aware that our life is not going the way that God said it should go. Live, have life and have it more abundantly. Then we speak and we speak up. We make our lives that we are a prayer. Our whole life is a prayer. 
and there's life in us and there's virtue that can be pulled out of us to heal others as well as ourselves, not just selfishly sinning. And then we speak to things. We speak to the mountains in our life. We speak to the situations in our life and in the lives of others. Amen. We speak to things like God did in the creation, things that are not properly ordered or things that are not properly situated or oriented or orientated. Things that are not the way that God says that they should be. We speak to things that are void and and formless. Things that are not like God, things that are not beautiful, things that don't have a good report or virtue. We speak to those things. We speak to those things that don't have love. Amen. We speak to everything that doesn't line up with the word of God. And we speak by using the word of God. And we speak to it. All we have to do is talk. Amen. And Jesus, the firstborn of many brethren, when he spoke, good things happened. Amen. Jesus was the first resurrected. He said, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. And even though he was dead, Jesus, he lives again. He lives forever. Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. And Jesus bore the curse, every curse for us, the curse of sin and death and sickness and disease and poverty, because Jesus has all authority. And he has now the keys, which is the authority to hell and death. And Jesus descended into the depths so we wouldn't have to. Jesus took captivity captive so we could be free. Jesus gave gifts to men for our abundant life. And Jesus came that we may have life and have it more abundantly. But you see, the gifts are for men. They're not for show and tell. They're not for magic. They're not for tricks. They are for men as we work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. And we also use those gifts to solve the problems of sin and death in our own lives, in our families' lives, down our bloodlines, in this whole earth, if that's what we've been called to. And all of us who are saved, we've all been dead in some way, spiritually dead whether we realized it or not. We've been dead in sin. We've been captive somehow to an evil enemy somehow by God. And God said, live. And the father said, live. And he really meant it. He sent Jesus to redeem us back into eternal life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord.